Good morning, Dr. Madrazo here. This is a transverse view of the epigastric area. We're going to start by just detailing a little bit the parameters that are listed here on the left side of the image, which include the frequency of the transducer, this is 4 megahertz, the gain is set at 37, the depth, the image is set to demonstrate the information to 10 centimeters deep. So on this image we see the uh, anterior most uh, structures is not very well seen because this is part of the stomach. But here we see an unechoic area that becomes larger as it approaches the right side. This is the splenic vein. So in front of the splenic vein is the pancreas because the splenic vein uh, is located on the inferior margin of the uh, pancreas. Behind the splenic vein is the superior mesenteric artery, the aorta, and the cava. So in ultrasound, areas that are fluid containing are anechoic. Now this is a sagittal at the same level almost. And here we're seeing the stomach anteriorly. The superior mesenteric vein becomes larger as it approaches the portal vein. And behind it is the inferior vena cava. We're beginning to see a little bit of the liver. So you can see the superior mesenteric vein and you know it rides on the region of the neck of the pancreas. So this is the neck region of the pancreas and underneath it will be the unsedate process of the pancreas. This is the cava. We're getting to see some of the liver detail. Now to discriminate the inferior vena cava from the abdominal aorta, there are two things that I will stress as we go on. Here is a transverse view of the liver, but just showing a little bit of the lateral segments of the left lobe that we know now are called segment two and three. Two is high by the diaphragm and three is lower. And when you see the left portal vein, which is seen here, this is already segment three. This is segment three and we have some areas that are more echogenic compared to other areas. So this is the left portal vein, lateral branch, medial branches of the left portal vein. Now this vessel on the other hand is uh, going to the periphery of the liver and joining with the cava. So this is a hepatic vein. The portal veins have bright walls. And why is that? Because they have surrounding the portal triads, we have glissens capsule. So while the portal veins have bright walls, which are fibrous, the hepatic veins do not. So you have the middle, the left, and a bit of a uh, a joining of the right and middle hepatic veins. Now, when you go to uh, uh, imaging, you will see, body imaging, you will see that we will detail segments 2, 3, 4A, 4B, 7, 8, those things. That is better portrayed on CT. However, the left hepatic vein borders the lateral, the medial most margin of 2 and 3 between the left and middle hepatic veins is segment 4A. And then segment 7 is under the right hepatic vein. And segment 8 is between the right hepatic vein and the middle hepatic vein. So you can see clearly that these portal segments have bright margins compared to the hepatic veins. Okay. One of the benefits of imaging uh, the gallbladder with ultrasound is that there are no gas-containing viscous anterior to it, so the gallbladder is always very well seen. And what you need to know is what's artifactual projecting into the gallbladder because it's anechoic. You can have reverberations and you can have problems with um, side lobes and slice thickness uh, artifacts. So these are linear areas that project in the lumen. But, uh, you know, you got to be careful because some of them project from the outside in. One of the things to do, the techs have now used a technique to clear this haze that sometimes is within the gallbladder. You can see that here they have uh, the conventional B mode, but then they change to harmonics. And this is a method where you eliminate some of these artifacts. They're still f having difficulties clearing completely the gallbladder. But here they managed to clear it, see? And how did they do that? They may have dropped their gain a little bit. Let's see. They went to 51. They cleared up a little bit. Okay, so one of the things to remember is the liver is unfortunately at risk of becoming fatty infiltrated. 
And when we image and the liver is fatty, it is more echogenic than normal. You can see some of these artifacts again entering into the uh, gallbladder from the outside in. So here we're getting to the porta hepatis. This is a sagittal display. The cava is on the, uh, the intrahepatic cava is on the undersurface here of the liver. This is the main portal vein. And then you can see what we did here differently is we added color. Now the systems are prepared to sense motion, flow. So they are now programmed to show in color areas where flow is taking place. The interest of the sonographer here is to demonstrate to you the, the common bile duct. So this is not containing any kind of flow. It's anterior to the portal vein and they're measuring the common bile duct, three millimeters. So the gallbladder and the common bile duct are unremarkable. Now you can clearly see those artifacts here over the gallbladder area. Now this patient happens to have a big heart and we were discussing that he may be in um, hepatic venous congestion because his uh, liver vessels are kind of prominent, especially the hepatic veins. The spleen, left upper quadrant, spleen is 8.1 centimeters. We accept the spleen to be 13 centimeters and be normal. The liver, we accept 15 centimeters, and her liver was, I think, 14, 11.9, 12 centimeters. Okay, so now in this case, we see that the gallbladder, which we see the walls very readily here, has some high uh, echogenic areas in the neck region that are causing a loss of transmission of sound. And this is what you would expect to see with gallstones, see their echogenic areas within the gallbladder that are causing the sound not to be transmitted. Why is that? because sound travels by compressing and expanding tissues and stones are inelastic so you end up not transmitting. This is another friendly artifact that I want to display for you. You can see that this is the gallbladder here so no, no sound was attenuated at this level because this is a fluid compartment without many interfaces. But beyond the gallbladder you see nice acoustic enhancement that tells you this is a poor attenuator. So fluid containing areas or very smooth um, soft tissue masses can transmit sound without attenuation so you get acoustic enhancement. That's because the system is calibrated to um, increase the strength of the sound pulse as it goes into the tissues, the sound waves. So no attenuation has occurred here. So the, the strength of the uh, ultrasound uh, signal is very strong did not undergo attenuation, so there is acoustic enhancement. And here is one area where the sound was attenuated. Now, in a good ultrasound practice, you always look at the back wall of an area. So this is a nice sharp wall, acoustic enhancement. This is fluid containing, and the wall of this gallbladder is two millimeters, which is normal. So gallstones, normal gallbladder walls, and again, some areas that they've put some color so they can find where the common bile duct is, which is anterior to the uh, portal vein, and they can measure it. They measure it from where they see the margin of the uh, common bile duct to the opposite margin. It should be leading edge to leading edge. We'll talk about that when you come in. Now, we're looking on the sagittal plane at the kidney. The kidney has a normal appearance when it has a nice, bright, echogenic central sinus. This is because there are many types of tissue in the sinus, including fat. So there's the collecting system, there's fibrous elements, there's the vasculature of the kidney. So this is the region of the renal sinus. It should be nice and compact. This is the renal parenchyma, and in this patient, we do not appreciate a difference between the cortex and the medullary regions. But the kidney is normal, it's about 10 centimeters in size. Now they put the color on and that helps us sometimes when the sinus demonstrates any anechoic areas they want to show us if they're vascular or not. So we have some arteries and some veins, but mainly arteries here. And here's the uh, region of the renal hilum. They put the color on and uh, so there is a 
huge cystic area related to the lower pole of the left kidney, 12.7 by 13 centimeters. And again, always look at the back wall because acoustic enhancement indicates that it's a poor attenuator. And I always should describe the wall. So that's a huge renal cyst off of the left kidney. Another renal cyst, another renal cyst, the big one. And there's the spleen. Okay, so now we have a menu that includes all the measurements that were obtained by the sonographer. Now on this patient, we're looking at his left kidney. And remember the sinus I showed you would that would be nice and compact and echogenic in the center of the kidney. In this patient, we have anechoic areas corresponding to a dilated collecting system. So this is what hydronephrosis looks like. And in contrast, we will see his opposite left kidney, that, his opposite right kidney that does not have hydro. So here's the anechoic collecting system, calyces, infundibular, renal pelvis, Calyces, infundibula, and renal pelvis. In contrast, here is his uh, normal left kidney with a nice compact central sinus and no evidence of hydro on the left. So um, this is the spleen. So we do a lot of these studies because sometimes the clinicians cannot tell if it's medical renal disease or obstructive uropathy. So knowing what hydronephrosis looks like, and we can grade hydronephrosis, uh, this one still has a rim of uh, renal parenchyma that is probably 15 millimeters. That's pretty good, so it, the kidney has not suffered atrophy yet. Here we see the uh, abdominal aorta, and unfortunately, bowel gas and uh, depth of, uh, of the aorta sometimes precludes its uh, display. But here we see the mid-aorta, and the walls of the aorta having, you know, muscular layers and sometimes atromatous disease, you're going to see them uh, very well uh, compared to the cava that the walls are more delicate. So here they've put the color on and you can see the aorta is deep, it's about 12 centimeters from the abdominal, anterior abdominal wall. And here they're measuring the aorta on the transverse plane. And the reason this has become important is because we all want to recognize an abdominal aortic aneurysm before the patient has a catastrophic event and comes in with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. So uh, there is a welcome to Medicare program when uh, males turn 65, they get a free abdominal aortic uh, ultrasound looking for aneurysms because aneurysms are not usually symptomatic. And then these would be the areas of the bifurcation into the common iliac. So just remember, I showed you the cable on the other case. This is the abdominal aorta in a limited fashion.